Hi from me, Romy Stach, and welcome to Derech Eretz, The Way of the World. In today's show, Chief Rabbi Goldstein talks about developing political and social sensitivity. We honor the life of anti-apartheid activist Helen Sussman and meet political journalist John Matteson. Societal concerns have always been prominent in Jewish theology and history. The Torah teaches in Exodus 23 verse 9, A stranger shall you not oppress, for you know the heart of the stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Chief Rabbi Goldstein elaborates further. Leadership is everything. If we have the right leaders, then this country can achieve its incredible, awesome potential and achieve really great things in the rebuilding of a country after the devastation of apartheid. But what is the key to great leadership? True leadership is about being able to put the cause before your own personal interests and that the purpose of the leader is to serve the people and to bring good into the world and not to enrich and to make himself great but rather to make the people whom he serves great and that word is key serve because that's the essence of leadership the Talmud teaches a very important lesson in leadership it sums it up in just a few words and I'll quote the original language of the Talmud I give you not power but service that is the essence of leadership. Leadership is not about the power that we can exercise over other people. Leadership is about what we can do to serve the people. That is the essence of what great leadership is about. And that was exemplified by the greatest leader of all time, described in the Bible, Moses, or as we say in Hebrew, Moshe. What did he do? He was a leader that is described by the Bible as the most humble of all men. He had a deep and profound humility which permeated his very being and went to the heart of what great leadership is about because it was never about him, it was always about what he could do for the people. And that's why it's, it's so interesting that when God came to Moses for the first time to offer him the job, Moses' first reaction was to say, no thank you, I'm, I'm not really uh, adequate for it. He, was, he, he said that he, his power of speech was impaired and that, he, that perhaps God could find somebody better than him to do it. And, and that's, that shows that it was never about him personally, it was about what he could do for the people. And this he demonstrated time and time again in his leadership when he said it was not about him, it was about the people and what he could do for the people. And that is the essence of what good leadership is about. And that is what we are so desperately needing here in South Africa. Leaders who truly care about the people and who do it for the service of the people, who care to serve people because of the good that can be done. And there's so much good. Government power has enormous opportunity. Opportunity not to accumulate riches for oneself, but opportunity to do good in the world. If you think about all of the government departments that can do good and uplift the lives of so many people. But what we need is government leaders and officials who truly care about the people. And of course there are, there are many who do, but there are many who don't. And, and that is the essence of what leadership is about. If we are asking our political leaders what we want from them, what we want from them is to lead this great country and to do it in a way which is all about service and not about power. Because there are truly great people in this country. We are a nation of heroes, great South Africans. We deserve great leaders. And with great leaders, we can unleash the incredible potential of this awesome country and achieve the greatness that God knows we are capable of and we can shine a light to the world to show how a society can be rebuilt after racism and inequality, to be rebuilt into a land of opportunity for all. That is the dream. That is the great South African dream. And may God bless us to achieve it. When President Nelson Mandela bestowed South Africa's Order of Meritorious Service on Helen Sussman in 1997, he said of her courage, it is a courage born of the yearning for freedom, of hatred of oppression, injustice and inequity, whether the victim be oneself or another, a fortitude that draws its strength from the conviction that no person can be free while others are unfree. I first met Helen 
when I was an undergraduate at Wits University and she remains one of the, uh, the great people in my life and one of the formative influences when I was a young man. I was working as a specialist a radiation oncologist in the hospital when suddenly Helen Sussman phoned me. I thought, oh my goodness, I should have offered to help write envelopes or lick stamps for her coming election, which was the municipal election in 1972. So um, she said, we have 13 candidates in the field already who've been working for some months, but we realize we need a 14th candidate for one ward. And so I said, oh, then you won't speak to Jules. She said, no, we won't speak to you. I said, you must be crazy. I'm a doctor. I'm not, I've never even been to a council meeting, no. She said, I'm giving you 48 hours to make up your mind, and she banged down the foot. Typical Helen. And uh, she was an interesting character. What I really admired about her was she had one passion, and that was justice. The Nationalists do not stand for white domination. The Nationalists stand for white domination only in what we call, what we prefer to call, white South Africa. Helen Postman, do you agree? There is a difference in that the National Party wants to separate South Africa into black areas and white areas, whereas the United Party is prepared to retain South Africa as one multiracial country, but it does not face the consequences thereof. Neither party, in fact, is prepared to give the black people of South Africa a meaningful say, politically, in the country as a whole. There is no easy solution to this problem. There yes, but there no could be a more realistic solution, and that is accepting the, the South Africa. Helen, your realistic country. solution. What is your realistic solution? The realistic solution is that you put the black man in charge of Af oh, South no, Africa. No, no, you oh, sure. the slightest but doubt. you sure there's you no reason why you should supersede white supremacy by black supremacy, you can have a multiracial parliament in South Africa, surely. Good, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do it with 16 million blacks? But you know, I and 4 million whites? But I think there's a great deal of goodwill still remaining among black people. If whites would only make the necessary concessions from a position of power and before it's too late. The one thing which is not celebrated and is not known was the extraordinary capacity for work. When one looks at her case histories, the parliamentary work, I don't know where she got the energy from. Uh, this is the energy of a 25-year-old woman, and she was then in her 70s when she was still in Parliament. Where did she get it from? And I think it was a combination of training, of discipline, and being quite aware that if she didn't do it, nobody would do it. That caseload of hers, that parliamentary work, is awesome. I don't think there's another parliamentarian that I know about in the history of South Africa who could match her. Order. Arising out of the Honourable Minister of Supply, is he aware that this man has now been detained and a good deal of that time in solitary confinement for over 17 months? Will the Honourable Minister tell us when it is his intention? either to charge or release this People forget that most of the time, I suspect, parliamentary life is bloody dull, then and now. And yet she sat there all those years asking the right sorts of questions. On the questions, she was always wonderful. And the other capacity she had was the quick reply. Uh, it was sometimes witty, it was always devastating when I think it was P.W. Buerta and there was no love lost between those two uh, had said that you are trying to embarrass the government with your questions and you're trying to embarrass the country. She said, she said it's not my questions which are embarrassing the country, it's your answers. She had contempt for the people who were in Parliament, the Nationalists. And when you have contempt, and when you feel that justice is not being done in any way, because of the one law after the other became worse and worse, she became stronger. 
because she had more and more content. So I was a great admirer of hers. In fact, though, we are a multiracial South Africa, no matter what devious me methods politicians employ to try and unscramble this egg. But we are indeed a multiracial country and we're going to remain like that. She had a strong ethical sense, which is partly, I think, derived from her Judeo-Christian culture that she grew up in. Uh, a Jewish home, school for 10 or 12 years in Park Town Convent, the friends she associated with. Uh, and sometimes the rows we used to have about the Middle East. <laughs> I think that the foundation in the last few years since Francis Anthony took it over has been doing amazing work. They're desperately trying to get back to the values, the morality, the lack of corruption and the remembering of your people. Part of our mission is to train the next generation of young researchers who can think critically can analyze problems, who can push the, the project of constitutional democracy further. Because we all agree that our constitution is worth defending and promoting. Without our constitution, we're back in the mess of the late 80s and early 90s. Well, you know, it was an enormous legacy because she was alone. And when you're alone, and when you're fighting a ghastly regime, it's something that Mandela respected, and uh, Tambo respected, and uh, many of the ANC people respected. Her understanding, I think, of social justice would have been premised on a question is this a violation of individual rights? Is this a violation of the rule of law? If it is, then this is wrong. And that's the beginnings of social justice. Where that came from in Helen's life, I'm not sure. But it was there. It was indelibly stamped there. Well, I think it's very important to know how to use being in Parliament. First of all, you've got to work hard. It's no good just leaving your seat empty. You've got to be there to hear the arguments and you've got to be prepared to stick your neck out and, and argue back, but with knowledge. So what's the legacy? The legacy is use your access and see for yourself. Don't take what the press says or what other people tell you as gospel truth. Go and verify. I think even if you're in opposition, that that's very important because I think a vigilant opposition in Parliament is one of the essentials of a sustainable democracy. John Mattison grew up in the suburbs in Johannesburg and began his professional career as a political journalist at the iconic Rand Daily Mail. As a journalist, John has spent much of his life in the thick of some of the most tumultuous events that have unfolded in the 20th century. My four grandparents all came from different parts of Europe. Uh, the Mattison came from Norway, uh, my mother's father came from Poland, uh, my grandmothers came from Lithuania one and England one. They were all Jewish. My father and, and I had a relationship that was, was, was entirely in opposition. Uh, I regarded him as racist um, and authoritarian. Um, you could say if... if to be honest, if I think of what I actually think he gave me was the ability to recognize racists and authoritarians and work out methods of dealing with them, to be honest. On the other hand, his father, whom I never knew, died before I was born. Um, most other family members say I took after him. 
Uh, so my grandfather, who came from Norway after the turn of the century, uh, was somebody who had supported uh, both the mikveh in Johannesburg, in Dornfontein, and a Dutch Reformed church in Linden at the same time. So he had some early notions, I don't want to overstate it, but he had notions that you'd be fair to people and you don't have to agree. He wasn't particularly religious, but he thought people who were religious should have a mikveh and it must be funded, and he did that. And he believed that people who were uh, Christians who supported the Dutch Reformed Church should have a church, and so he funded that. Um, so he was an interesting man and political and uh, 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 so, so peop a lot of people think that I, I took after him, although I never knew him. The one influence I think that actually I had, I would point to that uh, uh, affected my political values was, uh, funnily enough, the Jewish scouts I won him. I don't remember how to tie any of the knots they taught me or how to pitch a tent or anything, but we had a lot of political discussions. And it was also, of course, co-ed, so uh, uh, there was a little bit of chasing girls. So chasing girls and, and, and having political battles uh, was really uh, was a kind of refuge for me in a place that I could uh, grow and, and, and see, see the world in South Africa um, in a different way. For me, the way to fight apartheid was journalism. And uh, I managed to get a job at the Rod Daily Mail. And that was really powerful. We, we got into a lot of fights. I spent most of my career in litigation, uh, uh, trying to stay out of jail. Um, I got uh, a jail sentence for refusing to name a source on the Muldergate uh, scandal, which, as you know, brought down the government of John Forster. I don't know if we got a worse one after that in P.W. Buerta. Um, but uh, uh, that was a very, very uh, uh, intense and, and rewarding time because you really could uh, make sure that whatever else nobody could say they didn't know about apartheid. If you read your, day, your morning paper with your breakfast, you got to know about apartheid. And all the denials uh, uh, for me struck me as rather hollow because the information was there. The truth was the most painful thing, the most damaging thing to the government. It was not our opinions, our editorials. They didn't care if we attacked them. That was, in a way, uh, supporting them would have been the kiss of death. They didn't want our support the government. Uh, what they feared was the truth. What they feared was the facts coming out. When you exposed how black people were treated in group, group Areas Act removals or any of the other countless apartheid crimes, that's what they feared and that's what they went for you for. Um, so the point was to learn the disciplines, tell the truth, get it all out there and then leave it to the reader. I felt that what I was seeing and reading about South Africa and its history of the time that I was a journalist didn't match my own experience or recollection. And it took me a while to figure out what that meant exactly. It was quite hard to explain to people. And so I, I retreated to Franschhoek, uh, to, to a nice quiet environment where I could read and think and write. And I don't think I would have ever done it if I'd stayed in a big town. Uh, and uh, I slowly started to piece together what I wanted to say and how I wanted to explain South Africa during this period. And I found that there were unique things I knew that nobody knew, some conversations I had with Nelson Mandela. And you know, Mandela had such a wide set of relationships that many people didn't know what he was talking to other people about. And he and I had a mutual friend who was one of, I call him one of the greatest journalists South Africans never knew, uh, who broke open the Brudderbund. And uh, his friend, who was my friend, Charles Bloomberg, used to tell me about Ma his, his relationship with Mandela. And when Mandela came out of prison, I could talk to Mandela about Charles Bloomberg. So that was a story that, um, I mean, I, you know, journalists are taught to tell stories through individuals but you tell the stories of the individuals who will tell a bigger story, who tell, give you a theory, give you an understanding. Um, and I found that story was a way in to understand um, the role of the Brudebund, how the SABC was manipulated during the apartheid years, and what the theory, what, what the, what, how, they, how they justified it and how they organized it. 
Uh, and I thought, if you can find a way to tell that that's interesting and absorbing, you've got something. If, if you look at where we are now, where corruption has grown bigger and bigger, bigger, and, and the country is starting to notice, and I think is now fighting back and, and determined to stop it. I think I'm optimistic that they will. Uh, but I wanted to push the country in that direction. And what actually happened was the week of my launch in Cape Town, that night, after the launch, we all went for dinner, a group of journalists and I, and we suddenly all got messages on our cell phones that uh, Nene had been fired as finance minister. So that was 9-12, the day of the big, big uh, tsunami caused by President Zuma firing the finance minister. And that, I think, changed everything. So I can argue that my book pushed people to understand corruption. But after 9-12, I think my book surfed the wave of, of, of a change in opinion in South Africa. People starting to say, actually, this is the most fundamental. And now you find people of vastly different ideologies coming together on this issue because it's become so serious. Journalism is about morality. It is about the ordinary people. What is happening to them? How are they being treated? Are they getting their fair share? Do they have a voice? And are they being heard and, and seen? Uh, so I think uh, journalism is like that everywhere. Press freedom has to be defended every day. Um, and, and the same is true anywhere, anytime. And it's certainly true now because, of course, South Africa has gone through a very, uh, is going through a very difficult time. Um, uh, and corruption has risen uh, unconscionably, and journalists have been extremely important in bringing that to light. Look, the reality is I don't think of Derek Eretz as something that is in my life. It's not, it's not something I've studied or looked at. But the reality is I do believe strongly that everybody is equal. Everybody given the same opportunity has the same potential. And uh, for me, that, that's what it is to be a mensch, that everybody needs to be treated the same way. Everybody has the same rights as, as, as human beings. And, and that's my notion of being a mensch. The world's fourth and Israel's first and only woman to hold the office of Prime Minister, Golda Meir, said, One cannot and must not try erase the past merely because it does not fit the present. If you have missed any of our past episodes of Derek Eretz, you will be able to watch them on our Derek Eretz Connect YouTube channel. From me, Romy Stach, and the Derek Eretz team, remember, politics is not an end, but rather a process of fighting for truth.